All right, this evening we're going back to the text that we were looking at this morning, which is 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And what I'll do is I'll just reread those two verses as we begin. 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, Paul writes, By the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Let me just remind you that we're not so much doing an exposition of these verses this morning, but using the concepts that are here more, more broadly to understand what Scripture is and why it is valuable, why it is important to us. Now, by way of review, we've seen so far that our Lord calls us to defend His gospel outside the church, as we saw in 1 Peter 3.15, but also to contend for His gospel inside the church. Uh, the devil is doing all he can, basically on both fronts, to deceive the world and to keep it in darkness. The Father calls us to shine the light of the, the, well, the gospel of, of His Son, and to couple that with a life that matches, a life of, of love, so that the world might see uh, the things that we do the, the way that we're different and might give glory to God. And essentially the way that's going to happen is as they see the difference in us and hear the difference in us, they may ask us. And we need to be ready to tell them and, and defend the gospel. Now we also are reminded the devil's doing everything he can to derail the church at the same time to try and deceive her into giving up the truth, the Father calls us also to fight to keep the gospel pure within the church. Now, since the, uh, the first fundamental principle uh, of the gospel, that the Bible is God's word, is the foundation upon which all the other fundamentals rest, Satan works particularly hard to try to discredit it and we saw several examples of, uh, of this this morning of how uh, successful he's been in getting those who were uh, either in the church or influenced by it to reject all or part of the Bible. Uh, in many cases, also to add new revelation to it and to form new religions or what we were looking at this morning we would call Christian cults. And remember, a cult is is essentially a religion that's influenced by Christianity but has rejected one of the fundamental principles and so has destroyed the gospel. We saw many examples of this. Muhammad, it was, again I mentioned this morning, this is something I wasn't aware of, was originally influenced by a so-called Christian monk and in his days that's, you know, the people who were really serious about following Christianity were monks. But he happened to be an Aryan monk. He happened to be a Gnostic monk. He wasn't a good monk. He's not the kind of monk you would want to run into. But Muhammad rejected what he had to say, and he rejected the Bible, except for the writings of Moses, Psalms of David, and the Gospels. And he added his own new rev revelation to it, the Quran, and formed Islam. The Roman Catholicism, as we know, came from the historic church, we know that they accept the Bible, but they have added to the Bible the Apocrypha, the apostolic tradition, the continuing tradition of the church. And as we know, as you mix all those things together, they undercut the fundamental principles of the gospel. So Roman Catholicism, according to this perspective, would also be a Christian cult and not a true church because they have denied, as we saw this morning also, salvation by grace alone through faith alone. The founder of the Jehovah's Witnesses was originally in a Presbyterian church, Charles Taze Russell. And he, after that, went to a congregational church, then to Eastern religion, then to Adventism. Uh, and he eventually settled on a religion of his own, one in which he took the Bible and eliminated from it all references, or at least he thought, all references to Jesus' deity which is a fundamental principle of the gospel, and he created a cult. And for many reasons, it's a cult. Joseph Smith was raised by Christian parents, but he rejected his Christian upbringing, rejected the Bible, and anything that didn't agree with his new added revelation. 
And again, today, the health and wealth and victorious living movement essentially does the same thing. Even though they accept the Bible that we have, they take and twist its meaning to serve their own purposes. Essentially, God wants you to be healthy, wealthy, and victorious. And there's a certain sense in which that's true, but not in the sense in which they say it. So basically, the point was this. Satan is working hard to distort the truth. And our Lord wants us to work hard to defend that truth. Again, to ourselves and also to others. Now, how can we do this? Well, we've seen so far that we can defend it on the basis of its own affirmation that it is the Word of God. It claims to be the Word of God. Now, this would not be a valid argument for any other religious book, but we can make this argument from the Bible because the Bible really is the Word of God and it has authority that we need to listen to and submit to. God expects those who read this Bible or to hear it to accept its claims because he is speaking in it, he is speaking through it. And we need to understand that those who hear it or read it will be held accountable by him for what it says. Now, we saw several more evidences, again, the unity with which the authors wrote, with that perfect agreement on the most controversial of subjects, the accuracy with which they recorded the events, the peoples, the places, the events of history proven through archaeology, the standard of ethics that the Bible contains that no one in the world can actually keep except for the Lord Jesus Christ shows us that it has to be different. It is, it is supernatural. It is God's work because men do not write books that write them out of a promising future. They write books that make themselves look better, not worse. There's something unique about the Bible. The care with which it was transmitted from its completion in the first century until the present. And of course, one of the most powerful evidences, which really could be a standalone, and that is fulfilled prophecy. Now, this morning we ended with a fairly extensive quote from Steve, Stephen Larson that gave us many good examples. And I think his final statement regarding the prophecies fulfilled by Jesus was particularly noteworthy. So I'd like to just read that last small paragraph again. He writes this, or said this, this is a transcript of his lecture that was given at the, at, um, the 2010 National Conference. All of this recorded, all these prophecies about Jesus, hundreds of years before Jesus ever entered this world. And many of these prophecies are fulfilled not by his friends, but by his enemies who stand to lose the most with their fulfillment. And many of these prophecies being fulfilled before he was born and while he's still in his mother's womb and while he is in the grave. I think that part about the fact that, that his enemies were fulfilling the prophecies regarding him uh, because they would be the ones who had the most to lose by doing that and yet they were still doing it and really they, in a certain sense it couldn't have happened any other way. This is what the Lord knew was going to take place because this is what he had planned and yet they did it freely according to their own desires. So, fulfilled prophecy shows us that, the word of, that this is the word of God. Now this evening I want us to consider a couple more reasons, a few more reasons. We believe the Bible is God's word. Again, what that means, that it is his word and why it's important that we believe it. Now first of all, a few more arguments. Um, another reason we believe the Bible is God's word is because it alone, out of all the religious books, books that claim to be revelations from God, it alone reveals the God we actually see in the creation. If you look at the other religious writings that, again, claim to be the word of God, the God that they reveal is not the God that we see in the creation, but the Bible reveals the one that we do see. Now, remember, I think it was a couple of Sundays ago, we talked about some of the ways that we can defend the faith to unbelievers. You know, various ways, evidentialism, classical apologetics, presuppositional approaches to defending the faith. But we saw in the classical arguments that we can draw arguments from the creation. 
Paul tells us in Romans 1.20 that God has not only shown all men everywhere that he exists through the creation, but he also shows us what he is actually like. Let me just read that one verse again from Romans 1.20. For since the creation of the world, that is, from the time that God actually made the world, his invisible attributes, you know, that, that can't be seen um, with, with our eyes directly, can be seen through the creation. His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. They're not even obscured. I mean, they're clearly seen. Being understood through what has been made, that is, we come to understand it through the creation so that they, everyone in the world, is without excuse. You know, I read a, a bit of the biography of Helen Keller, who at a very early age became deaf and blind. She lost two of her major senses by which we, you know, perceive the world. And when, uh, was it Sullivan, I, for, is, I forget her first name, when, is it Ann Sullivan? She uh, worked with her and taught her to, to be able to communicate and so forth. Helen Keller knew that God existed before she even told her, before she tried to witness to her, because she knew from what she could gather from her remaining senses that God existed. Even she knew from the things that had been made that he exists. Now, I just want us to put our thinking caps on for just a moment, and I, I want us to think about some of the things that the creation does reveal about God, and some of this can be a little bit heady, so just bear with me for a moment as I try to summarize some of these arguments, because we, we do want to see that the, the God that is revealed in creation is the God that is revealed in Scripture. So what does the creation show us about God? Well. There's a few main things, but there's, there's really a whole lot, but I just want us to think about a couple. The creation tells us that God is eternal, that God is infinite, that God is one. There's not many gods, but one. And that he is the creator of what we now see. And what we're doing here is going just a little bit deeper into that when we touched on classical apologetics. But I'm going to try to summarize this quickly, so if it doesn't make any sense and you want to know more about it, you'll have to talk to me afterwards. So this is how we see it. If we look around, would, would, would we say that there is something that, that really is here, something that really exists? I mean, is that our perception? Does something exist? Well, the fact that something exists now means that something has always existed, always, because of cause and effect. You cannot have something coming from nothing. And it doesn't matter what Stephen Hawking has to say. It doesn't matter what any professor has to say. It is impossible. You cannot get something from nothing. So what exists has existed from the beginning. Okay, there's always been something that has existed. Now, that which has always existed must be infinite, must be without boundaries, must be without limits. And the reason is because it's impossible that there could be a place where there is nothing. Okay? Think about that for a minute. Uh, the idea of nothingness, you know, is, is not just a, an empty space. If I were to take a cubic foot and, let's say, empty it of all matter, would I then have a box of nothing? No, because I would still have space. There's still something there. It's, it is called space. Uh, as Jonathan Edwards once said, uh, nothing essentially is what the sleeping rocks dream of. That is nothing, okay? And that, it is impossible that that could exist because it's contradictory. Nothing and existence are co contradictory because nothing doesn't exist. It's non-existence. So you cannot say that there is nothing that exists somewhere. So anyway, the idea is that this something that has been from the beginning must be everywhere. So it's eternal and it is infinite. Now put on your thinking caps. We're going to get a little bit deeper here. <laughs> this something that exists from all eternity that is infinite also must be one because you can't have two infinites. You cannot have two things that are infinite, and why can't you? Well, because one would limit the other, 
and neither of them would be infinite. They would both be finite. But you know what? You cannot make an infinite out of two finites, right? You, you can't even have an infinite number of finites to make an infinite. Something is either infinite or finite. can't be both. And if, if something is infinite, it must be the only infinite. So there can only be one. I hope that uh, makes some sense. Now, this something, this being, which is infinite, eternal, and one, cannot be what we see now, because what we see now is not infinite, is not eternal, and it's not one. Can we say that about anything we see? That it's infinite, that it's eternal, or that it's only one? No, as a matter of fact, it's just the opposite. So it's not what we see now, it's something different. And then lastly, this being must be also the one, this something which has existed for, for all eternity and is eternal and one, must be the one who created everything that we see. And the reason we have to believe that is because if he is the one or this being is the one who is, is infinite, eternal and one who has existed from all eternity, he could be the only possible explanation for what we see now. So he's the only candidate. We have really no other options. He, this being must be the one. And as we saw earlier, because of what we see in us, that which caused us, that which created us, that which made us to be, were the effect, the cause must have what's in the effect. This being must have personality must have self-awareness, must have intelligence, must have imagination, must have purpose, must have morality. And so, you know, he's the one, you know, so, well, he's the one who must have made us. He must have these qualities that are in us in himself. Now, again, there are many other things that we can learn about God by studying the creation, but, but the point I want to make is simply this. There's only one book that claims to be a revelation from God that reveals a being that is exactly like this. The Bible tells us that God is infinite. God is eternal. God is one. God is the author of everything we see. God is the one who made man in his image with the attributes of personality and all the things that we've just seen. And the only book that does that is the Bible. So again, this reveals itself to be a revelation of God by agreeing with what it is God has revealed in the creation. Now that's the, the first of the few arguments. The second is we believe that the Bible is God's word because of its power to transform lives. We know that essentially the way God works is through his word and by his Holy Spirit. But this is the word that he uses and the only word that he uses. We read in the Bible of how Mary Magdalene, remember, who I believe was a prostitute, was delivered from that, delivered from demonic possession, and became an avid follower of our Lord Jesus Christ. We saw how Paul, excuse me, Saul the Pharisee, uh, his, his main goal in life was to destroy the church how he was transformed by our Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, from basically one who was destroying the church to one who did everything in his power to promote the church, who tirelessly preached the gospel, many times in very threatening circumstances. We read in church history how John Newton, the slave trader, who wanted to get rich by selling human lives, whose lives basically meant nothing to him. If a slave got sick, they would... You know, if they got a group of them that were sick, they would chain them together and throw them overboard. If they ran out of food, they would chain them together, a group of healthy slaves, and throw them overboard. And he didn't care how the Lord transformed such a man as that from someone who didn't care about the souls of men to somebody who devoted his life to ending the slave trade and bringing Christ to as many people as he possibly could. Church history is full of such examples of men, women, and children whose lives were radically transformed by the truth contained in this book. So we believe, secondly, that it's God's word because it has the power radically to transform the life from the inside out. It changes hearts. We believe that it's God's word because of, again, internal testimony. We have Jesus' own testimony to the fact that it is the word of God. 
And, you know, as far as presenting this to an unbeliever, we would say, well, what Jesus said was recorded by many eyewitness testimonies, and this is what he had to say about the Word of God. Now, by the way, I should mention in this example, Satan also knows that this is the Word of God, which is why he's trying to undermine it, but also why he tried to use it against Jesus when he tempted him in the wilderness. Now, what Jesus said in the devil's first temptation is a particular note. We read in Matthew 4, verses 1 through 4. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Well, what is it that proceeds from the mouth of God? But everything that is written, all scripture, is inspired by God. Now, there are many more reasons why we should believe the Bible is God's word, but let me just conclude this particular point with what is the most compelling argument that we really can't convey, but God conveys to us and that is the testimony of the Holy Spirit because he ultimately is the one that convinces us infallibly that the Bible is the Word of God. Now, I wanted to basically read the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 1, verse 5, because it is a wonderful summary of this whole point ending with that very thing. But this is what the Westminster Assembly, again, it's amazing that you get 120 plus men together, doctors and teachers of the church that can agree on a statement. They agreed on essentially everything that's in the 33 chapters there. 30, yeah. So this is what they write in chapter 1, verse 5. We may be moved and induced by the testimony of the church to an high and reverent esteem of the Holy Scripture and the heavenliness of the matter, the efficacy of the doctrine, the majesty of the style, the consent of all the parts, the scope of the whole, which is to give all glory to God, the full discovery it makes of the only way of man's salvation, the many other incomparable excellencies, and the entire perfection thereof are arguments whereby it doth abundantly evidence itself to be the word of God, yet notwithstanding our full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and divine authority thereof is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit bearing witness by and with the word in our hearts. You see what the confession is talking about here is what's been termed in theology illumination. The Spirit of God shows us the truth of these things. This is really what John is writing about in 1 John 2.27 when he says this, As for you... The anointing which you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need for anyone to teach you, but as his anointing teaches you about all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it is taught you, you abide in him. This anointing is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit convinces us of the truth, and the truth is this is the Word of God. So it's God's Spirit who opens our eyes, unstops our ears, and changes the conditions of our hearts so that we can see the glory of God in the Bible. We can hear him speaking in its pages, and we follow him from our hearts. This testimony is really so powerful that once we have received it, it makes us willing to lay down our lives for the truth that this book contains. It's that compelling. So there are many reasons to believe the Bible is the Word of God, and we need to ground ourselves in these things. We need to be able to defend these things to those in the church and to those, of course, outside the church. But particularly, we're looking at within the church so that we don't fall prey to the enemy. Now, let's look secondly, and these last two points are going to be briefer and just summaries. What does it mean that the Bible is God's Word? Well, it means, first of all, that God is the one who inspired it. And, by, and, and you know, I think you know by now, the word inspiration is really not a good word to describe the Greek word that's used here because inspired means to breathe in, 
but the word actually means to breathe out. So when we read this phrase, all scripture is inspired by God, we're tempted to think that inspiration means that the authors of scripture somehow breathed in the word of God and wrote it down, but it's actually God breathing it out through them. And it's not the actual authors who are inspired, but it's the scripture that's inspired. What is written by them is breathed out by God. It is the breath of God. All scripture is the breath of God. So when the apostles and their associates wrote under the guidance and control of the Holy Spirit into the situations in which they did, which situations were sovereignly ordained by God, what they wrote was nothing less than his very words. Now, it's interesting. I was listening again to um, a teaching series on Jonathan Edwards, really, really um, entertaining. But Edwards believed that when the authors wrote that they were aware that what they were writing was God's word and the way that they were aware of it. Because remember, the Apostle Paul wrote many more things than just, you know, simply the, the assembly. The letters that he wrote to the different churches, we shouldn't assume that that's everything he wrote in his entire life after becoming an apostle. But when he wrote those letters, he was aware that he was writing the word of God. And the way that Edwards puts it is that they experienced, he and the others who wrote, experienced a sense of the divine pleasure of God, the Holy Spirit working through them, so that when they saw what they were writing, as it were, it's not like they were ghostwriting or anything like that, but what they saw as far as in their writing and what they experienced, that they saw God's glory and experienced something of that in, in their writing of it. So it wasn't just like Paul thinking, I'm just going write, to write off a letter to this church to try to instruct them in this way, but he knew what he was writing was more significant than that. But the point is, it is God's word. Now it means second that the Bible, because it's his word, it's breathed out by God, comes with his full authority. The Bible has as much authority as if the Lord himself appeared to us in this room and spoke to us personally. That is how much authority the Bible has. And again, the Spirit of God will show that to us. It means, thirdly, that the whole Bible is his word. Not just the red letters, but the black letters too. And you know, hopefully, you know, those red letters can sometimes throw you off. They're convenient to know what Jesus was saying versus what others were saying. You know, and if you move from a red letter edition to a black letter edition, sometimes it's, you know, it throws you off and it's hard to tell. But the red letters are no more special than the black letters. All of the scripture is inspired by God. We noted this morning that when Paul was speaking to Timothy, primarily of the Old Testament scriptures, but this applies to everything that the apostles and their close associates wrote by the guidance of the Holy Spirit or the entire New Testament as well. Let me refer you to uh, Geisler and Nick's A General Introduction to the Bible, which has the most comprehensive thing I've ever read about how the Bible verifies itself. We looked at one example this morning about what Peter had to say regarding Paul's writings, that it was scripture that he was writing. So all the scripture is God's word. It means forth that every word in all the scriptures are God's words. We don't believe in thought inspiration. We don't believe that the Lord basically put certain thoughts in the minds of, of his writers of his authors and then they sort of put it in their own words we believe that every single word that is in scripture is the exact word that the Lord intended to be there and one of the reasons we believe that is because of the example that Paul gives us where he bases an entire argument on the fact that a particular noun is singular rather than plural his whole argument is based upon this in Galatians 3.16 where he writes this now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say and to seeds as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed that is Christ. Now if these words were not the precise words that God wanted, how could you base an argument on whether the word is singular or plural? How, how could you? It could have been the way the author chose to write it down. You can only make an argument like this if you believe that every word is precisely what the Lord intends it to be. 
And we know from the fact that this is the Word of God, if it is to be the very breath of God, the very expression of God, and come with all of His authority that extends to the whole Bible, it has to extend to every single word. It means, fifthly, that whatever the Bible says cannot fail to be true. When it records what the Father says, when it records what Jesus said, that's what they said. When it records a lie of the devil, that is an accurate representation of what the devil actually said. If God gives to us a promise, the promise is written accurately. And knowing, of course, who God is, we know that that is what he will fulfill. If he threatens something, we also know he will carry it out. We know the Bible is true and cannot fail. And along these lines, sixthly, it also means that the Bible cannot, does not, contain any errors. Now, we do believe that that applies to the original autographs. We have 5,000, well, with regard to the Greek Bible or the Greek, the New Testament. We have 5,000 witnesses to what that originally said. We know that we have what was contained in the autographs. And we know that even though it's translated into our language, that it still has that authority. You know, Jesus and his disciples, remember, uh, their Bible was the Septuagint. They ministered from that Bible, which is a translation, a Greek translation of the Hebrew and Aramaic Old Testament. And they quoted it with authority because it was still the Word of God, even though translated. So even though we can't read the original language, we still have the Word of God. So it does not contain errors in even, uh, even in, our, in our translation. Okay, so that's what it means that the Bible is the Word of God. The most important thing we need to see from this is that it carries all the weight and authority of God himself. Now, finally, why is that important, <laughs> that we believe the Bible is God's Word? Well, it's important, first of all, because it is His Word. God has given to us His revelation. And it's, I mean, how can we put a price on this? It's, it's invaluable. It's a treasure. We need to see that God has actually entrusted us with a treasure like this. And we also need to know as we saw before, because he's entrusted it to us and we know something of what it says, that God expects us to do the right thing with it, okay? He wants us to listen to it. He wants us to obey it. It is God's word. We need to understand that it is so that we will listen to it and we'll give the weight to it that we need to. Secondly, it's important because if we don't believe this is God's word, we cannot be saved because the Bible is the only place where God reveals his gospel. It's not revealed anywhere else. If we don't believe that what he says here is true, that it's his word, that it's his infallible word, that it comes with his authority, we'll never trust to Jesus to save us because this book is the only book that tells us that that is the way of salvation. If we don't believe it, we're not going to take it. We need to believe it's his word. It's important that we do. It's important that we believe it's his word because, thirdly, we'll never be sanctified unless we do. We'll never learn what Jesus is really like, who, you know, who is the Father's perfect image. If we don't understand Jesus, then we really will not have any idea what the Lord is doing in us because the whole purpose of salvation, remember, is not just that we might be saved from hell, so that's a part of it, but that we might be, come like Jesus, so that Jesus might be the firstborn among many brethren who share his nature. What that means is that he might be the first or, or have the preeminence among a people who are just like him, his brothers and sisters. That is ultimately what God's purpose was in saving us was to redeem us from hell, make us trophies of his grace so that we might be transformed into the image of Jesus so we could be given to Jesus so he could be the first among a people just like him. Now, if we don't understand that the Bible is the word of God, then we might not really know the purpose of, of salvation. We will not be sanctified. I mean, that's really what Paul's addressing in the, in the second part of what he says in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Because listen again to what he says. 
All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for what? For teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Read this so that we might become like Jesus. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. How do we know how to do that? Only through the Word of God. If we don't believe this to be the Word of God and that this is God's will for our lives, we're not going to give ourselves to become like the Lord. We're not even going to know how to do that unless we believe the Scriptures. And then fourthly, it's important that we believe it's God's Word because if we don't, we also won't believe the people who are around us are in danger and we won't reach out to them with the only message that God uses to save because we won't believe this either. Now, Peter knew this to be true, which is why he was willing to testify even before the Jewish rulers. He said to them in Acts 4.12, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Now, if Peter did not believe these things to be true, I doubt that he would put his life on the line by telling the Jewish leaders the very thing they did not want to hear. But he knew this is the only way he could honor the Lord and that he might be used for their salvation is to tell them the truth no matter what the cost. So it's important that we believe this so that we'd be willing to risk what we need to to love our neighbor by bringing the gospel to them and then fifthly, it's important for us to believe the Bible is God's word so that we can fight to defend its truths in the church. If we don't see its importance, that everything that we believe is built on the fact that this is God's word, we're not going to fight for it the way we should. This is the foundation. And really the gospel either stands or falls on the fact that the Bible is God's word. We need to be convinced this is true if we're going to fight for it and do all the other things, of course, that we've seen that, that only the word of God can do, that the Lord uses uh, to bring about these changes. So the word of God is important. The Bible is his word. We've seen many reasons why it is. We've seen what that means, and we know why it's important. We need to ground ourselves in these truths for our safety so we don't drift away from the truth. We don't get caught up in a cult. We don't wander away from the church and so forth. And it's important to defend it within the church so that our brothers and sisters don't fall prey also to the cults. Now, next week, we're going to consider the next foundational principle, fundamental principle, and that is the Trinity. Uh, now that we you know, have basically established the foundational principle that this is the Word of God, we are going to make all of our defenses essentially from the Scripture. We can also appeal to reason as well and, and what we see in the world and so forth for some of these as far as the fallen nature of man. Has he fallen? You know, when you look at the world, what do you think? Uh, the Trinity, there perhaps are some arguments from reason, but most of these things are going to come directly from the Bible, and certainly the cults will engage you at that level, particularly the Jehovah's Witnesses. But I've already told you the Mormons have their slithers, and they all have their slithers to try to get away from the truth. But we need to know the truth. We need to stick to it. We need to defend it. We, know, we need to know how to defend it for ourselves and for others. So next Lord's Day, we'll consider the doctrine of the Trinity. But for now, let's, let's close. Let's um, spend just a moment, shall we, in silent prayer, and let's ask the Lord to give us grace to see that this is His Word, to strengthen that testimony of the Spirit in our hearts, and to be ready to defend it.